All right, unit two, lesson two. We're going to continue our work with polynomials. Um, a polynomial is a function that has a continuous graph. So again, a continuous graph is something that has no holes or breaks in it. So we could say this would be a continuous. If you get a graph that is kind of like a piecewise or a step function, maybe it does something like this. This is not continuous. So this would not be a polynomial function because it's got a break in it. Additionally, continuous functions for polynomials have smooth rounded turns. So it might be something like that. Whereas if we think about the absolute value function, it's got a sharp V to it. So we would say that again, this is not continuous because of this sharp, this sharp corner right here. Um, again, this is probably review, but uh, we can transform our functions. We can move them around. So thinking about the function f of x equals x to the third, it's gonna look something like this with a zero. That's the parent function. So if I wanted to reflect it, okay, I could reflect it. And if I made it, hey, I want to see f of x equals negative x to the third, my graph would be reflected. And it's going to flip. I can move this graph up or down. I could say, hey, f of x equals x to the third plus three. And again, I'm going to get my parent function, which was this one. But I'm going to shift it up three. And we can also move it to the left or to the right. So if I took f of, let's say, x plus one, to the third again that's going to shift it over it's kind of opposite that's going to shift it over to the left one unit so again this would be negative one zero so just a quick little reminder of how we can flip uh how we can flip flop those or we can transform our graphs We also have something called the leading coefficient test. And the leading coefficient test kind of works like this. So all these graphs eventually rise and fall. And so we can look at the degree, the highest degree of a polynomial. It's going to be even or odd. And then its leading coefficient will tell us some kind of basic information about that. So again, our kind of formula for a polynomial is f of x equals whatever my leading coefficient is. Then I've got an x to whatever degree. Oops. Plus, again, you could have as many x, like as many variables as you wanted, but then you're going to eventually end up with a degree of one and then just potentially a constant, which would be no degree. So if our degree is odd so if our highest degree is odd so again if this right here is an odd so if n is equal is odd our graph is going to do some type of movement where i'm moving down to the left and up and to the right and that's going to be kind of um or 
my graph is going to be moving up and to the right and then eventually go down into the up into the left and down to the right so if n is odd i know that eventually my graph is going to have it's going to be going in two different directions whereas say n was even when n is even i'm going to have some type of graph but my end behavior is that they are both going up they're both rising up or both parts of my graph are moving down so again we can look at our highest degree so again the exponent that's the biggest and if it's an odd number we know that it will look something like the first two examples and if it's an even number we know that it will look something um like the bottom two examples <clears throat> All right, so if I look at the example, let's just do a couple, A and B. I'm going to say f of x equals negative x to the third plus 4x. And then B is f of x equals x to the fourth minus 5x squared plus 4. So I'm going to look at the leading coefficient and my highest variable. So again, it's I know that it, the highest variable is x to the third, so it's going to be odd. So it's going to look something like one of these two. And this is when it's positive, when my leading coefficient is positive. And this is something like when my leading coefficient is negative. Kind of same idea, positive, negative. So... I have x to the third and it's negative. So I know that it's go my graph is gonna look something like this. So let's say we go to Desmos. Maybe I type in negative x to the third plus, oh goodness. 4x and yep that's exactly what i would expect again my end behavior my graph is moving up to the left and then it's moving down to the right so that's kind of what i expected whereas if we look at our second example okay this time i have a highest degree of an even number and my leading coefficient is positive so if it's positive and even again i'm going to expect it to go up and to the left as well as up and to the right is my end behavior. So let's check that. Let's check that out and see if we are correct. So I'm going to say x to the fourth minus 5x squared plus 4. And yep, as my graph moves up and to the left and it goes up and to the right for its end behavior. So it looks like I was correct. Um, another really big part of polynomials is finding zeros. So kind of like some basic rules again about finding zeros is X equals a is a zero of the function F X equals a is a solution. So again, we could have X equals a, we could have X equals a if you can set the entire function equal to zero x minus a is a factor and that's what we're going to do a lot of is factoring f of x and then we also have again if y is zero so this is like your x intercept so there's like four different ways that you could potentially find um, polynomials zeros and so we're going to do them algebraically and graphically. Again, using Desmos makes it very useful, but sometimes you might not have access to Desmos, or again, you have to prove it algebraically. So let's say that we get a function f of x equals 
x to the third minus x squared minus 2x. And I want you to find this zero, okay? So again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use kind of the second method where I'm going to say, I'm going to make this equal zero and I'm going to somehow algebraically solve it. And so again, I don't know how to factor when I have exponents with a degree of three, but I do notice that each of these terms has an X in it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor out an X from each term. And now I'm left with X squared minus X minus two. So there's a lot of ways to think about this problem. I like to think about it, call it like a factor X. So I'm going to take my first number here and my last number here, and I'm going to say, okay, what two numbers? So I have a one and a negative two. So I'm going to say one and I have a negative two. And so these two numbers need to multiply to get negative two. So again, if we say that this is A, this is B, and this is C, we say A times C, and then I put, they need to add to get B. So add to get B, and then multiply to get A times C. Well, one times negative two is negative two. And then if I think about how do I get negative two plus one, that's gonna equal negative one. So what I would say is, hey, I could factor this out as x minus two, x plus one. So I'm gonna say, all right, and then I can't forget to bring this x down as well. So now I've got it in a workable, like a workable method because think about the power of zero. Zero times 5,862 equals zero. Zero times anything is zero. So if I can make this equal to zero, I know that that's a solution. So that one's easy. That's x equals zero. If I can make this whole equation equal to zero, then my entire equation will equal zero. So that's like saying x minus two equals zero. Therefore, x can equal two. And basically the same thing over here. X plus one is my zero. So I'm gonna say x plus one equals zero x equals negative one. So this equation has three zeros. And again, that kind of makes sense because our highest degree was an exponent of three. Now we could use our graphing calculator and we could say x to the third minus x squared minus two x. And it kind of already calculates our zeros for us. 2, 0, we had, 0, 0, we had, and negative 1, 0. So, yes. And we should write these as ordered pairs. So, again, 0, 0, 1, 0, negative 1, 0, 2, 0. Okay. So we may get repeated zeros um, where if, for example, we have the function f of x equals x to the fifth minus 3x to the third minus x squared minus 4x minus 1. And so if we graph this, again, there's going to be some zeros that maybe don't cross um, they don't cross the x-axis at x equals a. Um, and so again, we want to find the real zeros, which are the ones that do cross a. So if I look at my graph and I type in x to the fifth minus 3x to the third minus x squared minus 4x minus 1. 
Again, I've got some other numbers. Like I only care about the, the ones that cross zero. So 2.115, negative 2, negative 0.254, and negative 1.861. Because the quadratic factor, if we were to factor this out, we would get something like this. And again, you don't necessarily have to do it, but those three zeros are the zeros from this function because this quadratic right here, the yellow one, has no real zeros. All right. So you may also have to, you might be given the zeros and then you have to work backwards to come up with the quadratic. Given that my zeros are negative one half, three, and three, let's try to find the polynomial function. So given the zeros of negative one half. Now, thinking about x equals negative one half, there's kind of two ways you could set this up. You could set this up as x plus one half, or you could set it up as two x um, plus one. So again, if you think about if I were to solve this, this would be negative one half or two x plus one equals zero. Subtract one, two x equals negative one, divide by two, x equals negative one half. We don't like fractions. Fractions make it harder. So we're going to use this one as our function. So again, if I was to find the polynomial, I would say 2x plus 1. These are the same. And again, these ones are easy. It's just x subtract 3. So I could say x minus 3 squared, or I could do 2x plus 1, x minus 3, x minus 3. And so I'm going to have to use the distributive property. So again, multiply here, multiply here, multiply here, multiply here. So I'm going to keep this 2x plus 1 at the end. x times x is x squared, negative 3x, negative 3x plus 9. Uh, combine like terms, 2x plus 1, x squared minus 6x plus 9. And now I have to use the distributive property one more time into each term. And so if I do that and I combine like terms, I'm going to eventually find 2x to the third minus 11x squared plus 12x plus 9. And so I'm able to work backwards like that. Okay, let me see here. I think sketching. So again, we can use the leading coefficient test and we can use the highest degree of an exponent to kind of sketch a graph by hand. When you're sketching graphs by hand, it may be helpful to use a table of values. So again, you want to at least have a negative number. You want to have something that's pretty close to zero, maybe 0 0.1. And then you want to have, again, so maybe a negative 0 0.1 or a 0 0.5, maybe you want to do 1, and then 1.5. So again, what you need to do is you need to be able to find where does it cross my x-axis, where are my zeros, and what is the end behavior? I got to be able to draw my end behavior. So if I had the graph, f of x equals 3x to the fourth, minus 4x to the third. I see, hey, I've got a positive coefficient and an even number. So going all the way back to right here, I know eventually my end behavior is gonna go up and to the left and up and to the right. If I were to plug in these numbers and find out this, um, this one's gonna be, I'm gonna change this one to 0 0.5. This would be seven, negative 0.3125. Oops. One is negative one, and then 1.5 is 1.6875. So again, if I'm just kind of sketching it out, I know, hey, I'm gonna finish going up and to the left. I've got some type of zeros here. 
um, cause I can factor these out and I'm going to say, all right, my zeros are somewhere over here. I know it's going to finish like this. So if I were to graph it, it might go down and then come back up like that. Again, kind of sketching it by hand. Kind of the last, uh, thing we're going to talk about is the intermediate value theorem. And what this means is that if you're given two values and your function is continuous, then there's going to be a value in between those two. So if I take a graph and I say, hey, this is f of a, and this is a, and this is f of b, b, I know that if it's continuous, Again, there's no breaks, there's no sharp corners, then there exists somewhere where f of c is going to equal c as well, okay? I can assume that there are going to be, there's going to be a point there. Intermediate value theorem. So there must be a real zero um, in between there. So when this comes into play is say you've got kind of a function, let's say f of x equals 12x to the third minus 32x squared plus 3x plus 5. And can you guarantee that it has a zero? So I could like make a, you know, type in some values, find out, hey, when X is negative two, when X is one, what are we finding? So negative two, I get X is negative 225. Negative one, X is negative 42. When X is zero, Y is five. When X is one, Y is negative 12. When X is two, negative 21, three, 50 and 4, 273. What you're looking for is when it shifts from negative to positive. So because it's a, it goes from negative to positive, and then it does it again right here, I know, hey, the only way that it goes from negative to positive is if there's a zero. Because the only way to go from negative 42 to 5 is if you pass zero. So somewhere in between negative zero and one is a zero. Somewhere in between zero and one is a zero. Somewhere in between two and three is a zero, okay? And then again, we could graph it and actually find that out. <clears throat> 